मित्रो नमस्कार आय ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ पुणे इंटरनॅशनल सेंटर अँड आर इन्स्टिट्यूशनल पार्टनर गोखले इन्स्टिट्यूट ऑफ पॉलिटिक्स अँड इकॉनॉमिक्स अँड डिलाइटेड टू वेलकम ऑल ऑफ यू टू दिस लेक्चर ऑन मॅनेजिंग अर्बन रिडेव्हलपमेंट बाय डॉक्टर बिमल पटेल द डिस्टिंग्विश्ड आर्किटेक्ट अर्बनिस्ट अँड अकॅडेमिक We are also delighted to have with us Prof. Abhay Pethe, Special Advisor to the Vice Chancellor, Gokhle Institute, Professor of Urban Economics and Senior Fellow, PIC, as the Chair for today's session. Dr. Patil inspires us with his multidisciplinary approach to architecture, urban design and urban planning aimed at enriching the lives of people in our cities. His most significant project projects include the ongoing Parliament House and Central Vista transformation, restoration and expansion of Gandhi Ashram Ahmedabad, Vishwanath Dham, Shri Kashi Vishwanath Mandir, Varanasi, completed last year, the detailed design for the Sabarmati Riverfront Development Project, and planning for the redevelopment of Mumbai Eastern Waterfront under the Mumbai Port Trust. I may mention that he is also engaged in preparing the master plan for the Somnath Temple in Gujarat and the Pune Riverfront Development Project. Dr. Patel's research areas include land use planning, real estate markets, building regulations, land management, architecture and urban planning history. Our distinguished speaker earned his diploma in architecture from the School of Architecture CEPT Ahmedabad in 1984 where he is the president today between 1985 and 1990 he studied research and taught at the University of California at Berkeley from where he received a dual masters architecture in city planning in 1988 and a phd in city and regional planning in 1995 He heads HCP, a multidisciplinary design planning and management practice based in Ahmedabad. And in 1996, he founded the non-profit Environmental Planning Collaborative, which has contributed significantly to the transformation and planning and urban design in Gujarat. Dr. Patel and his projects have received numerous awards, including the Aga Khan Award for Architecture, in 1992 the prime minister's national award for excellence in urban planning and the padma shri in 2019 dr patel will be speaking to us on the need for transforming our cities and their peripheries as india and indians become more resourceful and wealthier in a growing economy professor abhay pethe special advisor to the vice chancellor gokhle institute and professor of urban economics is the chair for today's session and a member of our family at PIC and Gokhle Institute he is a senior fellow at the PIC and a guiding light in our projects on urban issues i would like to briefly mention that pune international center is a think tank now in its 12th year and works in the areas of national security environment energy and climate change social innovation science technology innovation ecosystem and urbanization and economic reforms PIC's latest book India's pathways to success winning in the next decade has chapters on urban development and sustainable mobility by the eminent scholar Dr Ezaz Ghani a senior fellow at PIC and Dr Ravi Pandit along with authors from the PIC Our books and research papers are kept on display in the lobby. Before I hand over the floor to Professor Pethe, I just want to say and add my two cents worth as a journalist for the last 30 years. So we are anguished by the corruption in municipal bodies and the state of our cities today. Our national capital is one of the most polluted in the world. Our citizens are suffering from various cancers, lung diseases and even heart attacks. because of urban issues our children want to cycle but our city planners have been unable to deliver cycle tracks swachh bharat and sulabh sauchalays are making a difference and yet 
even a city like Pune has among the filthiest public toilets in the world. We at PIC are action-oriented optimists and on this positive note, I shall now hand over the floor to Professor Pethe. Before that, may I please request all of you to welcome uh, Dr. Bimal Patel and Professor Pethe with a loud applause. Thank you for having me here this morning. Extremely happy uh, to be having a vantage position here um, in the presence of a preeminent scholar, somebody who straddles the practice and academia with consummate ease. And as Abhay, the other Abhay mentioned, the extremely prolific nature of various things he has done. Uh, but he's also been extremely prolific in working in academia, in bringing up and expanding SEPT as the president there, so on. Now, I don't want to come between you and him. We are all eager to listen to him. But uh, I'll take a couple of minutes to say something about, since I have held the urban professorship, so here goes. Now, notwithstanding the great Mahatma, I do believe that the future of India is urban. It naturally follows that uh, these urban spaces, whether you look at them as cities or uh, regions and so on, I personally like to think more in terms of urban regions now rather than just cities within municipal boundaries which have become quite unmanageable as they grow. Uh, they need to be nurtured and cared for. The problem is that cities, whereas they create wealth and value and add value, the way we have set up our tax system, they are deficit entities and therefore necessarily require investments from higher level governments which enjoy the fruits of what cities do through tax buoyancies. So, I think it's a matter of pragmatism that higher level government should be investing in cities, not hand, handouts or aid or something like that, but investment so that they will continue to also benefit through the tax dividend. Now, as we urbanize with pace, we need to be ready to navigate at least four points of challenges. One is the people, resources, planning and political economy. Now, people's trust is extremely important and something which is not very easily available for various reasons, variety of reasons, whether it's the information flows or whatever. Resources, as I just mentioned, are Cities are always starved of resources whenever they want to do any kind of infrastructure development or redevelopment or take up any projects. Especially post-GST, cities have been uh, completely rid of uh, all the revenue handles. The only possible revenue handle that we have is the property tax. But the world over, we know that property taxes, even when most reformed, are not able to give more than 30% of the expenditures of the city. So they need to depend on investments from uh, outside. As far as planning is concerned in India, uh, I have done some work and what I've noticed is our remarkable ability not to learn from the past. That uh, the fact that we do plans and uh, people from Sept and the uh, architects and so on sometimes don't believe that others like sociologists and economists and political scientists are required for it. They do that these kinds of plans. Not Mr. Patel, as Abha just mentioned, he takes a multidisciplinary view of things. But a lot of the people I find they speak a different language and are unable to communicate with others that we have here. More importantly, the state capacity to implement, whether it is resources or 
pure technical implementation is not taken into consideration while doing the plans as a result of which conformity of the actual realization to the plans is very, very bad. I mean, for Mumbai's DP, I found that the conformity was to the tune of 7%. I mean, no one believes that everything you plan should be done, but surely 7% is not something that we should be happy about. We should learn something from it. And I've come to the view that planning and uh, at the city level at least and at the regional levels ought to be minimalistic and it should be strategic rather than more of doing very, very micro stuff. Of course, I must not fail to mention the elephant in the room, which is, and rightly so, which is the environment and the climate that we are all seized of. And again, rightly so. And whatever projects you do now, will need to have, will need to pass the filter of this particular uh, requirement. And that's not easy. Again, probably uh, Dr. Patel will mention why. He was talking about it just when we were having tea just now. Simply because people are not informed about it and there isn't a healthy dialogue, whether it's the government, whether it's the people, whether it's the architects or the planners and so on. Now, intervention in urban spaces can be either brownfield or Greenfield, again, my own view is that perhaps Greenfield is slightly easier than Brownfield because Brownfield in urban spaces is always so much invested with vested interests, political and otherwise, and so much value is there that it becomes very, very difficult to do redevelopment and renewals. And probably what uh, Dr. Patel says will tell us, give us some insights into uh, what kind of uh, ways and tactics are to be used in order to uh, succeed there. But I also hope that you might mention a couple of failures that you've had because I personally think that there's a lot to be learned from failures. Successes are, of course, uh, always good. They keep us going. So... We are eager to listen to you, sir, and uh, then we might take some questions at the end of it. And uh, so without further ado, may I invite Dr. Patel. So, good morning, friends, and thank you very much for coming to listen to this talk. I'd like to particularly thank Sabai Vaidya and Professor Pete uh, for the kind introduction and for inviting me to give this talk. So, thank you very much. Uh, let me start, not with the presentation, but with reference to what Professor Abhay Vaidya said at the end of it. I think Professor Pete also alluded to. Our cities today are frustrating places to live in. Uh, they are not comfortable, they are not really particularly livable, they are not particularly efficient or not even as productive as they can be. This we all know from daily experience and we all try to figure out ways in which we can improve you know, our comforts a little bit how we can do things to protect ourselves from the things that cities inflict on us. Some of us who are much older know a time when life in cities was not so uncomfortable. Uh, Pune was a lovely town and uh, Ahmedabad likewise when I grew up was a small, really small city. The 60s, it was, it, it was much easier to live in some ways. Um, in Ahmedabad of that time than it is today. Today it's far more difficult. So this is a fact. We're, if our cities are not only in a bad shape just now, but they seem to be getting worse because they are growing 
they're stressed, everything seems to be falling apart. Housing, infrastructure, services, governance, day-to-day -day cleaning, everything seems to be falling apart and things seem to be quite dismal. It's easy, it's very easy to let this frustration turn into a, a, a you know, to, to sort of beat us down. I'm not saying you said that. In fact, you, you, you said you remain optimistic that things can be improved. And that has really been the philosophy of my work since 25 years. I worked at immense lots of work at municipal level, at state level, at central level on how to fix things in our cities. And it is frustrating, but I too feel something can be done. And now I just say, how soon is this going to happen? You know, friends of mine sometimes, sometimes at dinner parties, sometimes at gatherings ask me, when will India get a good city? And I'm always telling them, not in your lifetime. It's not going to happen in your lifetime. It's not going to happen in any one of our lifetimes. When societies urbanize, it's an epochal change. You, you, you shift from being a rural economy, a rural society, to being an urban society. It's an epochal change. It happens once in the life of any, 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 any society. It happens once. And indeed, anywhere that urbanization has happened, things have fallen apart, completely fallen apart. It's not as if anybody else has done any better than us. Even the people whose cities seem very livable just now, you just have to go back 100 years, 150 years, and look at where they were and see where they have come from. Tell me one place which has systematically urbanized. Tell me one place where urbanization has not been messy. Tell me one place where things haven't seemed absolutely impossible. Whether it is London, whether it's Paris, whether it's Hong Kong, whether it's Singapore, any place in the world that today seems like it's livable and nice and we love to go to it, at one time was a mess. And let me say, a mess far worse than ours. Far worse than ours. You just have to go down history, read Charles Dickens, and you know what London of the 19th century was like. And from that, it has become something different. You just have to look at what Hong Kong was like in the early 20th century. In fact, I've seen the Hong Kong 30 years ago and the Hong Kong today is, is, is different. And that is where all the hope is. If you will allow me, I will recommend you a book that a friend of mine who has seen me at work for the last 25 years recently brought from London for me. It's a book called London, A City at Its Zenith, 1870 to 1914. See, London at that time was sitting atop empire, just before the First World War. It was sitting atop the Raj in India. It was the capital of the world. It was the most important city in the world. Okay. It was the place, for the, economically the most dynamic place, it, technologically the most advanced, politically the most important in the world. Not even New York, nobody in, in the US was more powerful. But this man who has written this book, very recently published two, three months ago, uh, has divided the book into four chapters, 1870s, 80s, 90s, and then 19, uh, uh, 1900 to 1914, 14 years at the end. And he takes you through a journey. He, his author is called Saint Andrew Saint. And he takes you through a journey through these four decades. And tells you about all sorts of things in London. No, no particular, no, it's, it's not a particularly, an, a particularly analytical, systematic, uh, you know, boring book. It's a very interesting book because it will talk about what was happening in, you know, who were the poets at that time? What was the art like? What was housing like? What was poverty like? What was infrastructure like? What was governance centers? What was the system of governance? What was politics like? What was economics like? All sorts of, it's fun. It's a fun read. And you see the dismal condition. I mean, the 
the Trafalgar Square, the description of Trafalgar Square and how the home, how homeless people used to hang around in Trafalgar Square, drunk at night, not finding a job, what housing was like in London, what cholera was like in London, what water supply was, what sewage was, what governance was. There was nothing called a municipal government at that time. No multiple jurisdictions, nobody knew what they were doing. This, the, the river was a particular stinking mess. And yet the book is incredibly hopeful. Because what it tells you, and the author says it in, in you know, just as in passing, because he doesn't want to make, I mean, he just wants you to actually feel it through the reading. 1870 to 1914, on every front imaginable, every front imaginable, there was progress. London still wasn't in 1917 or 14 uh, what it was. Sorry, 1914. It was it's not what it is today. Today it's an enchanting city. It, it's, it's terrific. Many of our relatives live there. We walked there. We we walked around there. It's wealthy. At that time, it was also wealthy, but it was uh, you know the poverty was much worse. Anyways, it wasn't in 1914 like it is today. And nonetheless, between 1870 and 1914, he shows you through his through this romp that he takes you on, how on every front there was progress. And indeed, you know, I, I, you know, when his friend brought it to me, he said, you will love this book because it's so hopeful. And indeed, I have worked in municipal corporation. My first, first project in the municipal corporation in Aldabad was 1994, when I went and tried to explain to them that a street has to be, can be designed I proposed the project, I worked with corporators, I worked with the standing committee at that time. I, I called my professor from Berkeley to come and give a lecture there. So I've been working with the municipal corporation all those years. And I remember, I see the 30 years in front of me what Ahmedabad has moved. And I can see the progress. So I, I am most hopeful. I am like uh, the PIC, an absolutely optimistic person. Not optimistic in the sense that I think everything will turn out right. No, 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 not at all. It will, it can turn out right if we work on the problems and we try to fix them. Will we not make mistakes on the way? Of course we'll make mistakes and we must be, if we do something, we'll make mistakes. But improvement is possible. So that is the, that is the sort of philosophy by which I have worked and many of my colleagues have worked. We are now a large organization. There are many, many colleagues who, who, who work uh, along with me. Uh, and uh, both at SEPT as well as at, uh, but more importantly, in my professional work. And so I'm going to show you one project, one bit of improvement that we tried in Ahmedabad, in the planning system there, in, I think it was in uh, 14, 2013 or 12 or something like that, 2012. And that's, I'm, I'm going to show it in a more general fashion. So let me just start with that. Uh, and I, I, I'm happy to answer questions afterwards. So let me say the following, and this we don't need to spend too much time on. India is urbanizing. Everybody knows that. More and more people are going to live in towns and cities. And let's, uh, you know, that is a given fact. At one time, we used to argue against this and try to stop this. It's no, no longer the case. We have, we, India is urbanizing. And very soon, uh, the people will increase. What's also very good is that India is also becoming more prosperous. Right? This also is a fact. We can see that very clearly. And per it, with prosperity comes increased levels of consumption. Okay? And this consumption increases in everything from the clothes we wear, food we eat, etc. But also the amount of floor space we consume. So you cities are, are being stressed by two things, more and more people living and their levels of consumption rising. So it's an exponential increase in the amount of floor space that we need in cities. And remember, in cities, the only important thing is floor space. Nobody, no, nobody can live like in a village, uh, <laughs> a pai bar laga ke, uh, you know, you, you need floor space in cities. So really the important thing that you need to survive in a city is, 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 is floor space. And that's what urban living is about. And, and we are needing more and more of that. So, as a consequence of this increased demand, more and more floor space is being added to Indian cities. This is a fact and there is nothing, you know, very... 
This is leading to two things. Two, the phenomenon is leading to is a peripheral expansions of towns and cities. Very simply, you're, all the cities are exploding. I'd recommend to you a, 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 a atlas of urban expansion. Uh, somebody in New York has charted this across cities across the world. Every city in the world, like ink plot, has grown out. Also, the other thing that's happening is already built up areas of towns and cities are being redeveloped. This is the two simple things that happen in any city that is at our stage of development. There's nothing complicated about this. Both these phenomena need to be well managed. Okay? Peripheral expansion needs to be well managed and in-city redevelopment also needs to be well managed. But the key question is what does it mean when we say well managed expansion and redevelopment? And second key question, how can we manage it better? It's not nothing, you know, these are straightforward questions that you ask if you... Now, I'm not going to talk about peripheral expansion today, because that's a whole other talk. I'm going to talk about in-city redevelopment. Peripheral expansion is, is another talk, and, and, and that's, a, that's also a problem that needs to be solved. But the more complicated problem, in a sense, as Avaiji said, it's, is the brownfield not the green field. How do you make brownfield redevelopment a little better than what we are doing right now? So let's start with that. In-city redevelopment, how to make it better? So vast swaths of built-up areas of Indian cities are almost certain to be redeveloped. Okay, This we know. As soon as demand increases and so, you know people want to stay in center of town, the old parts of town are going to expand. Small low, small, low buildings are going to be torn down to build larger, taller buildings. And this is from small colonies where bungalows are torn down and apartments come up to, you know, uh, uh, larger buildings and they are torn down and full towers come up. Uh, redevelopment is spectacularly underway in Mumbai. Okay, you can see it when you go from the sea link, you see uh, in Mumbai, all these tall buildings coming up, these are all, this is all that phenomenon, low buildings giving way to tall buildings. There's nothing new about this. New York was not always a tall city. You can see in 1876 what it was like, and then 1932 it became a tall city, and 1988 and 2013 it just keeps cities, if there is demand for floor space, you will have growth. One way or the other at some point, regardless of what some planner wants to do or not to do, eventually people will say, let's tear it down. What is most important to ensure when cities are redeveloped? When small buildings give way to big ones, what is the most important thing we must achieve? And, and my proposition is as follows. I think you will perhaps agree. Nothing is more important than ensuring that as a city is redeveloped, its street network is improved. Because you can keep Bombay, all of us see it. The buildings are going up, but the streets are remaining the same. There is a tall building, 40-foot street going up, which used to serve bungalows at one time. Same 40-foot street is serving these tall buildings. How is it ever going to work? Who? who? You know, what, this can never work. So, the street network needs to be improved in Indian city. When we say street networks in India need to improve, what do we say actually? What do we mean? What needs improving? Two things. Our street networks in Indian cities, if you analyze them, they have two problems. We have too few streets. Our network is not sufficiently dense okay? and they are often too narrow. It's not just one problem of narrow streets, but it's a problem of lack of streets. So that's one issue that needs resolving. We need more streets and we need... Second, we need them to have a grid structure instead of a branching structure. Okay, what a, it's a very simple idea, nothing very complicated in this. In Ahmedabad, if I go from my home, if I decide to go to the office, which is in center of town, I live in the periphery. It's 12 and a half kilometers. It takes me 25 minutes to reach um, from 
periphery to inside because Ahmedabad is a good street grid network. My driver puts on the map on the on the car and checks where we can save three or four minutes because there are five alternative routes. If you have a if you have a grid structure, you get five alternative routes. If you have a branching structure, you have to take that one route. You know. So we must transform our branching structures into grid structures for the streets. We must widen our streets and we must add, to do this, you'll have to add a few more streets. Okay, this is very straightforward. There is nothing that just almost follows one from the other. So here is an example of what the, at the same scale, what the street structure of Ahmedabad, Mumbai, New York and Portland look like. Okay. It's very instructive straight away. You can see they are all showing the same area, same scale. You can see Ahmedabad. You have, uh, you know, you have very few streets. You can see Mumbai, very few streets. All of them lead up to one street that everybody has to be on. So it's a branching structure. Look at New York, the same area. Now we want buildings like New York, but we don't want a street structure like that. It will be a problem. Look at Portland. Okay, That's the street structure. That is why those cities work. You can see that in our, our same area, 16% of the area is in streets in Ahmedabad, 11% in Mumbai, in this particular square. Okay? In, I don't think in any Indian city, I'll come to that later on, but any Indian city, you have more than 20% of land in the streets. Okay? But in New York and, uh, and in Portland, you have 35, 40% of land in the streets. And our problem is, we have to go from that to that if we really want our cities to work. And is there a way of doing that? Given all the mess that we have, political economy mess that we have. So both we have to widen streets and add new streets to make the network more of a grid. These are the two objectives of any, any planning. This must be the objective. At this stage, this is perhaps the most crucial thing to ensure. Let me also add more infrastructure and more public transport and all the fancy things we want to do like bike lanes and pedestrianization, this and that, everything can be done afterwards. If you don't have a street, don't have space for streets, kuch nahi hoga. Forget about it. So sometimes when we try to get these advanced goals and forget this most basic thing, we are bucking up the wrong tree. It's impossible to widen streets and improve networks once redevelopment has taken place. When redevelopment is taking place, it's a great opportunity that we must use. This is exactly what 19th century European city planning was focused on. Unfortunately, a lot of our planners, like me, they were educated. They are educated in the West, come back and try to address problems that western cities are facing today we should be facing we should be tackling the problems that western cities faced in the 19th century not what they are facing today okay this is a very important simple thing i have myself studied abroad i know what what they teach there they are interested in all sorts of things like sustainability goals and environmental stuff and this and that sorry for being so caustic about this. But our problem is to get space for the streets first. If we don't have that, nothing will happen afterwards. Okay, we'll be in a much bigger soup. Okay, so tackle what you have. It's like a poor man looking at a rich man's house and he says, you know, his son is doing this, that, and this. the poor man will say, Bacha, tu apne pehle ye kar le. Do pe, do generation ke baad. Next generation will do better. Don't try to leapfrog. Here's an example. This was London in 1666. Small town on the river. By 1850, this town had expanded out. And if you look at the street network of London, all the black streets are the ones that were added in the 19th century. Can you imagine if these were not added in the 19th century, what London would be like? It would be impossible to negotiate. Okay. Take, they were doing in the 19th century projects like this. This is Regent Street, cutting through new streets. 
they were doing it in their political economy i'm going to talk about our political economy afterwards and this region street this network looks like this this street network was made in the 19th century they were not born with this this is paris 1834 a tense ugly mess there are wonderful movies of paris of that time the stinking river disease filth that's when houseman did these fantastic improvements built sewage built all these streets in the 19th century of course they were they had no democracy at that time we have democracy so we have to work with the democracy i'm not going to advocate that we have don't have democracy and 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 after we finished these were the big boulevards running through paris which today we go and visit and say kitna acha so this work was all done take this island on the on 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 the seine no in the middle you can see on the river you can see an island in the middle that island used to look like this in 1754 at that time they cut it through and put these bridges and new streets and today it becomes a part of this is what you visit okay so 19th century mein bahut kaam kiya in logon ne and they've done the sort of work that we need to do here given our situation when we think of our situation five facts have to be kept in mind okay when we think of our situation first it's impossible for local governments to forcefully acquire land for street widening and for new streets forget it india is a democracy what time a houseman used to work for a dictator and they could just bulldoze their way through places in india people try doesn't work they still try and i'm not saying they should even try we should say we should accept the fact that in fact there's better way to do it than bulldozing things through so it's impossible to acquire a uh, uh, land forcefully you must never try to do that a little bit of minimize the amount of force minimize yeah you it, nothing is possible completely voluntarily we all know that but minimize the force second you know one advantage we have today because of extremely poor planning in the past few decades is that we have a lot of underutilized and unusable land in the private domain the challenge is to bring it voluntarily into the public domain okay voluntarily i'm not saying to it forcefully there's lots of land in india india wastes land like no other no other country in the world urban land let me explain what i mean by this this is amdavad okay and in amdavad uh, you can see the river running north to south and these four squares we studied these four squares we've actually studied these squares a paper available on 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 you can look it up on google uh these four squares in the middle of amdavad and let's uh, th- these are the four squares they are all at the same scale and i look at center of town here this one square here okay and it's 500 meters by 500 meters and if i did a, a a a picture of it from the sky this is what it looks like okay that's that's square that's the satellite picture of it in this 500 by 500 meters total area is 25 hectares you have 4.3 hectares 17% of land is in the public domain by public domain i mean streets and parks things that we use right all of us can walk in nobody can be stopped from entering and it is very very important in any city we must always find out how much land is in the public domain uh, it's very straight from i mean the more more land you have in the public domain better your street network can be the more efficient more productive your city can be more efficient transportation can be also the more parks and gardens you have the better life can be for everybody Every, you know unless you have private parks today nobody can enjoy anything for ordinary citizens what's important you have in the public domain parks so the amount of land that you must have in your public domain must be large not small larger the better in that case if you can have 20% 25% 30% 35% 40% 40% good pretty good there are other competing uses of the land and that is what you must look at also and that other competing use which planners never take into account 
largely because this data wasn't available till recently until we had satellite pictures or Google images. Thank God uh, we have Google. This land use category is how much land is covered by buildings. How much building cover do we have? You know, they, these, these people, environmentalists, do forest cover. In, in cities, the important thing is building cover. Okay. When you check how much land is covered by building, what you are finding out is how much ground floor space you have in the city. Ground floor space is a particularly valued asset. People want ground floor because it has a great relation, I mean a special relation, unlike any other floor on the ground, it is important. It's always priced very high compared to any other floor. Uh, if you, the more ground floor space you have, the more floor space you can stack up in a city without going tall. So if you wanted, if you for example, you said, I don't want a city that's above the treetops. The more ground floor space you have, the more floor space you'll be able to stack nonetheless. Okay. Second thing, the more ground floor space, the more floor space you stack in any unit area of a city, let us every, every square kilometer, how much ground floor space, the more floor space you stack atop it, the less your city will have to spread out. It's very simple. There's nothing, it's just arithmetic. The more, the, the, the less density of floor space you have, the more, more your city will have to expand out into the periphery. We, we cannot redu reduce the number of people who are going to live there. That is a given. If you, earlier people thought you could reduce that, but you cannot reduce that. So, the, so it's better to stack up floor space. If it's better to stack up floor space, then it's better to have more ground floor space. So this number should increase. But in Indian cities, nowhere in India, you will find this number, building footprints, more than 25%. Or 22, 23 actually. Most cities, Delhi may doubt. Or center of Delhi will have 15, 16. Splendidly low number. So where is all the remaining 57%? It's all this space around buildings that is in the private domain that even the private individual cannot use very effectively because statutory regulations do not allow that person to. These are the setbacks, margins, gardens that bylaws force you to leave in your cities. If you ask a planner how much you force people to live, they won't know. But the city will tell you that the impact of those bylaws is greater than 50% of the land has to be left open without building cover. Okay. That's the 57.2% area. That's a vast amount of land to leave open like this. Take the periphery of Ahmedabad, you get the same story. Now I'll go a little faster here. Okay, you periphery of Ahmedabad looks a little more well planned and orderly. However, public realm has 17.2%. Building footprints, building cover is 25% and 57% in the now we know what these spaces are like. This is how those spaces are used, right? We know the space between buildings. People try to make some use of it. It's very difficult to make a use of it. They put some barsati and some, something like that. They will put some, they use for storage like this. This is the suboptimal use of land we make in our cities. There has to be a better way of doing this. You know, compound walls, some bit of planting. That's not. Somebody tries to have a front yard, front yard where they'll make a They'll make a step like this. This is how we use most of our land. There's some parking in the common places like this. You take Mumbai, where the land is costliest, and you take Nariman Point here, same story. You have private open space. This is where you have uh, maker chambers, the biggest offices, and this is the way we utilize land. You see, these, this is private land, not utilized well. Bandra Kurla complex, same story, 43%. This is land that was, this is recent planning, but we are still doing it. So, as a fact, you have Indian cities, almost 55% of the land is used, is, used, is private 
open space. Right? And 20 to 25 is public realm, 20 to 25. Now compare it to other cities of the world. You have reached, you have London here in this area. You have 4.8 percent. The building cover here is 65 percent and 30 percent in the public domain. That's why they have streets like that, many streets like this. Take San Francisco, same story, 36 percent in public domain. Building footprints have 61 percent. Vast amount of building cover here and you have very little land wasted which is not utilized in some way. So here you have spaces like this in the middle of the city because it is efficiently planned. Okay, you have narrow streets but many of them. Here's Paris. Everybody loves Paris. 34% as you can see here in the park building footprints 56%, 9.6% in private open spaces, all courtyards inside those plots. Barcelona, same story. We have an example of these sort of developments here in Ballad Estate in Mumbai. It's pretty much like this. So you have streets like that, that's what. So in comparison, the, the cities that we admire, we think are well planned and we think are livable and efficient, have 35 to 40 percent in the public domain have uh, 20 to 25 and uh, 50 to 55 in building footprints and only 10 percent and less than 12 10 percent land in this okay so we have to go from our present 20 percent to 40 percent if our cities have to become better so that i'm setting up the problem for you third we must remember that infrastructure is never built in one go okay it can be built over time. No city in the world has built its infrastructure at one go. Everybody, you know, it's political sloganeering to say world class city. When I world class city, clearly world class paisa chahiye. And we don't have world class paisa. Okay. So Hong Kong that used to looks like this. I mean, Hong Kong functions because of the tremendous infrastructure it has. Uh, uh, subways and buses and tramways and, you know, everything that it has. And it looks like this today. That's the skyline of Hong Kong. But you know, not long ago it looked like this. And in the 60s and 70s it looked like this. It did not have all the infrastructure that it has today. The infrastructure was put in afterwards when they became richer. New York, same story. Built its infrastructure on the go. And we have to build our infrastructure on the go. You cannot build it at one go. Here's Times Square in New York before 1900. You see, there, that time they didn't even have cars, they didn't have this, now you have 1908, this, they have cars, vehicles, all sorts of subways below, and now they've even turned it into pedestrian. Okay, So, uh, uh, I I infrastructure is built. They've turned it into pedestrian because they have public transport. They have public transport because they have the money and build public transport. You don't have the money. So hold on, our our entire our, our New York moment will come afterwards, not just now. Infrastructure is very costly. I, uh, you know, uh, you cannot read very clearly here. Small things, the manhole covers we see out there are expensive. Sewage lines are expensive. Tramways are expensive. We don't have money. Look at India's per capita income compared to China's and look at it compared to United States and then we want to have infrastructure like United States, how can we ever have it? We know that a fecal sludge system will cost $11 per household and a proper sewage system will cost 54 We don't have the money. So let's, let's make do with what we have and slowly build up. But what we have to do just now is get that space for streets because we don't have that space for streets. Nothing else can be done afterwards. The fourth thing, once you have a robust street network, a lot of floor space can be added, infrastructure can be added, etc. Here's a great example. San Francisco at one time used to look like a city like this. Low rise mainly. You can see Bay Bridge, I think, here in the background. It used to look like this. It had a grid of streets. Primarily a low-rise city in 1913, 39, 
and later on it became dense like this you can add once you have a grid of streets or baad mein bahut kuch ho sakta hai then you can put infrastructure you can put buildings and you can improve it and now san francisco looks like this and the fifth is the most important point modern city building whether new york london ahmedabad pune is a messy incremental uncoordinated long term activity propelled by commercial interests there is nothing you cannot wish this away what planners can do is provide some rudimentary amount of coordination and what they must learn to do is to use the commercial forces to create public benefits okay that's the that's the trick if you can't do that then you are fighting a force that you will never win against you have to actually like judo you have to use that force to your own advantage and that's the whole point here you look at city building process anywhere i just told you of a book uh, about you know cities were messy dirty and built bits and pieces you you read that book on london and you'll understand how that infrastructure was built paris this is the construction in paris in 19th century these were we are living in such construction sites today uh, so we find it very uncomfortable uh, but uh, if we want our grandchildren to live in a different way then we have to do what we have to do today so is there an indian model for managing in city redevelopment well and example from my favorite city which is ahmedabad okay. and here is what we tried so this is ahmedabad you can see that uh, it has a ring road all around uh, and, and it's 5 million people 300 square kilometers spread out uh, river running through the middle and you know the ring road has a diameter of 20 kilometers and i'm going to talk about center of town bang in the middle that red rectangle that you can see this is center of ahmedabad and that red line you can see here is the area i'm going to talk about it's 1.25 square kilometers that was the planning area it's expanded since but this was the first project at that time when the plan was made the metro line was to be built right through the center you can see that on ashram road another metro line was to be built cutting right so this was in the in the crosshairs right so bang in the middle of the city and this is center of town this is where pressure is to build more floor space and has always been pressure to build more planners have tried to stop that from growing that work people have built illegally sometimes and then their planners have caved in our city center seems congested but is it really congested look at look at what the picture used to look like 10 years ago this is not a congested city center i mean on the street it would feel like that because we have only 20% of land in the street so the street felt congested but this is a, this is like in the you know the suburbs or somewhere that's what a city center is like that's the amount of floor space we will need regardless of what you uh, like or don't like that's the kind of city center you need if you have this then you don't spread your cities out too much if you have that kind of development you will eat into vast more areas add costs over long period because you have to travel long distances you have to add more infrastructure spread out cities don't work compact cities are in the long run environmentally also more sensible because you save you reduce the footprint of the city by making it concentrated some of us might not like living in these sort of tall buildings but remember we don't have to live in it the next few generations have to they will be used to it so uh, so this is what city center needs to be this is not a congested city center you know it had it used it has small buildings like this and because of the planning restrictions they would be replaced by small big buildings like this this is not a big building also okay so like many indian cities the city center in ahmedabad is not congested it's just poorly planned and has a poor land use distribution it uses the land in the wrong way it doesn't put anything into streets it doesn't put anything into building cover it puts everything into all that wasted space all around so if you look at that 1.25 square kilometers this is the macro numbers if you look at every plot the fsi available uh, in i'm talking about in the year 2010 uh, approximately was uh, 1.8 was the plot fsi available there 
okay, plot level. But the planners are interested not in plot level. That's what builders are interested in. We are interested in in, in gross across this 1.25 square kilometers. If you counted the roads and everything as part of it, then the effective FAR was one. So you built as much floor space as the amount of 1.25. So you can see that if you have 1.25, you have approximately. There was 22% in the public domain, 25% in building cover. The rest of it all wasted all around. So what the Ahmedabad Municipal Corporation did at that point and outer, they woke up to the fact that we need to densify. But the first thing you have to do is to increase the FAR. And that every city is doing these days. Now it's quite fashionable to increase FSR. Pelletha it was restricted, but now it's quite fashionable. Amne to nikal diya limit, amne bada diya, amne... Everybody says that. That's easy. So all it requires is to change a number in some file. Some text, that's all it needs. So of course the cities are very eager to do it and appear progressive, but that's not being progressive. That's just asking for stress. Ahmedabad did that. When it did it in the city center, it did it along all public transport routes. So this grid you see here of tall buildings is where we have BRTS system and where we have the metro. So along BRTS and metro systems everywhere the FSI was increased in a band next to it. This is a very standard strategy. Here is Seoul. You can see the public transport network and you can see the red zones are the ones which are high density zones. They are selected to be high density. This is the same strategy in Kuruchiba where you have a uh, higher FSI along transit corridors and then you get tall buildings so that people there are using the transit rather than using transit. It's a very standard strategy. So Ahmedabad did that as the first thing. But increasing FSI as I said is easy. The more difficult task is to ensure that your street network improves along with it that this increased floor space doesn't just add stress that actually you have now done something too. So we develop a plan along with AMC and Auda, to meet this challenge. And our plan did some of the things that uh, uh, Professor Pete was talking about, being minimalistic, being realistic, given our political economy, so on and so forth. So we said that in this area, we would see in future a development like this. This area in future is going to be like this. This is just an artist impression. And we said that instead of the maximum permissible FSI per plot 1.8, it's going to be 5.4. If we look at the consumed gross FAR, it's going to be 4.21. We are going to basically quadruple the amount of floor space that is there. But the more interesting thing is we said that the public domain at the end of this transformation will be 40%, not 20% that it is today. So we'll double our streets also. Okay. And building footprints cover will increase from 25 to 50 percent. Okay. So that, that was our objective. Now it's not possible to tear down all the buildings and then build a new grid of streets and then build a new city. Is that possible? A sensible planning strategy, and this is where Professor Pete's comments come in, has in India a sensible planning strategy. It doesn't you don't, you cannot, if you cannot put tick marks on all of these, all of these, forget it. That's not planning. That's just wishful thinking. First of all, we must respect property rights. It's nonsensical to believe that property rights need not be respected. And very many planners actually in the bottom of their heart don't want to respect. I say, this land belongs to somebody, it belongs to government, it belongs to this individual, that individual, that must be respected. Because that man will fight you to the nail. If you, if you say that I'm just going to take your land away. Okay? You must find a way of doing it in a way that he wants to give it to you. It must be, any plan must be considered to be fair and desirable. If it's not fair and desirable, they won't. I'm not saying everybody has to because there will always be some, but vast majority of people have to think it is fair. Then you might need some force in some cases, but... It must be financially viable for developers. They build our cities. It's very fashionable to demonize developers in India. It's a, it's a standard thing to do. Demonize the private sector, demonize the developers. They are the ones who are the culprit. They are not the culprit, my friend. They are the ones who are making possible a new city. And you must 
it must whatever we suggest it must make financial sense for you know when we say make financial sense for them what we mean is really make financial sense for the consumer because for them what makes financial sense is what is so it says it should make financial sense for all of us is what we are saying it must be financially viable for the development authority you already talked about the fact that we don't have resources you know one important thing that all planners have to learn is to not look up for money so i'm going to raise the resources myself i'm not going to raise i'm i'm going to raise it out of this process i'm not going to look to state government for money that's a very that's that's traditional indian planning that state government and now all this jnu are there I mean, these smart cities they are throwing money at cities and and and, and cities are, are unfortunately not saying that i'm going to make my money i'm not going to depend on that grant from somewhere okay and that's the spirit that was there in amdabad at least before this silly jnu rm thing came up and and subsequently uh, and, and that can be seen in this plan it must be legally implementable we don't have to say anything about that in india we are uh, you know it has so the plan has to meet all these criteria and make our cities livable and productive for ordinary people Uh, by ordinary, I don't mean it in a in, in a bad way. I mean just normal people who are not don't have SUVs of their own and who don't have private gardens of their own. I mean ordinary people who live in apartments, do a job, uh, who are poor. That's what the plan must make sense for. So that's what I'm. So the concept is like this, okay? And I'm, I'll explain. There are few steps to it. and let me start with the first one so this is the 125 square kilometer area that i talked about earlier you can see it's next to the river there's a big road passing through the middle uh, the land in public domain is only 22% at this point when we start off okay i'm going to zoom into this small pit to show you what the plan does to explain the concept so if i zoom in this is what that place looks like This is Ashram Road running through the middle. You can see that fancy rendered building in the middle. That's Kobuzier's uh, Mill Owners Association building. And then these are um, you know set of other buildings here uh, that you can see quite clearly. This is a big block. Uh, this is exactly the kind of block we must not have. It takes uh, it's 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 one kilometer perimeter. Okay. So this is this is the situation. If you go to Pune. and do a drawing that's the kind of situation you will find more or less so the first job is to widen existing streets and add new streets the first thing you go in there and say okay i'm going to examine this in detail and i'm going to propose road widening wherever there are existing streets okay now this is carefully drawn i'm not going to take this land away from these people straight away so please don't worry if you have a plot of land here i'm just drawing this on a plan as the future the road is going to be like this wider okay. i'm also going to add some new streets in my plan once again don't worry i'm not going to take this land away okay you see i put the road strategically you can see on the right hand side it's put between two plots uh, it's it straddles two plots so that if this building redevelop i gets half a street right and i get that road widening the point at which this man decides to redevelop i'll take his land away i'll tell him if you want i can pay you for that but if you want you can keep the fsi of it and use it in your remaining plot so most people will agree saying i'll keep the fsi and develop it so no no developer is going to give up fsi so i've done when he redevelops i get some land out of this without paying him anything and the fsi any case is what i had in the beginning when the next guy does it this is what i get so i got my full street now and this is and when will they redevelop well whenever they redevelop because that's not my choice that's not the planner's choice this is the choice of the economy and the people who are there at some point i might need you know i've got all 90% of the widening of the street i can take a little more i might do some forceful widening at that point but i've drawn the widening line in such a way that it does not need breaking anybody's building so i'm carefully surgically put in all these lines i'm i'm going to show you after so future my street configuration will become like this 
in this area. If this happens across the whole area, I move from that to that. It's as simple as that. I've just drawn lines on paper just now. As it gets redeveloped, my street network simultaneously is also improving. I've got the same amount of floor space because I've given the same amount of FSI. Okay, so 22 to 40%. Now I have to do some simple building regulations. I have to mandate setbacks and access ways for emergency vehicles, etc. So I say remaining plot may. These are the setbacks. Everybody will have to leave. I'll have to, you, you know, if you're if you're neighboring plot, then you have to leave six meters from that neighboring plot because I need you to leave space for a fire engine to go through, etc. This land is a setback. I'm not going to appropriate it. Your land, but like normal margins, your margins. This will be the margin line you will have to follow. But apart from this setback. The entire land that available to you, you may please build it. This is your building cover available. So instead of the present low building cover, suddenly now the fellow plot owner finds, oh my God, now suddenly I got, I can, I have large building cover. Okay. So that's, then my bylaws are even, so my bylaws become very simple. I've drawn them on a piece of paper. I don't have a textual rule that I have to apply afterwards, I've drawn it on a piece of paper, see, it's not, it's not a building. everywhere all around I have access for emergency vehicles, which is the primary thing, I've taken some bit of the land away, I've improved my street network. Then I say vertically, this is how tall your development envelope is, development envelope, you may build as the coverage of what I've given you, and the height, this is the dabba within which you will put your floor space. Okay. This is also drawn. There is nothing ambiguous about this. No special architect is needed. The plot owner can himself know it. And no administration difficulties in these bylaws. How much floor space can I build inside this? I have made the development envelope bigger than the amount of floor space he can. You can see if he was to use full 5.4 FSI, this is, and the full coverage, this is the block of building person will be able to build. Okay. Nobody will build like this. Because ground floor you need a lot of space, but the upper floors you need a tower. Right? Everybody wants ground floor pay. They, one or two floors they might do more, the rest of it. So actually what they build will look like this. But inside that envelope they have enough space to shape their building in the way they like. This also frees architects to use their creativity to build whatever they need for that particular plot. Just now, the architectural creativity of our architects is used to seek out loopholes through which you can maximize FSI. This is, architects are like the excise lawyers of earlier times. You know those excise lawyers before GST, all they were doing was finding one loophole and helping you reduce your tax. The architects today are doing nothing but grand excise, excise lawyer type of architect, find a loophole, maximize FSI, then put some nice skin around it. That's not the way. This is, now it frees them to do what they really ought to be doing. So then, perhaps in the future, you would get in this block buildings like this. I've just drawn some shapes. This fellow will decide what makes sense for him. But on the ground, you can see it will be block, bigger blocks on top, there will be towers. But I do also want to ensure coherent build form. So I might tell all the people that your buildings must all line up against the road because at the road I want, at the, you know, cities are experienced when you're walking on the streets. So if the buildings are all lined up properly, that'd be nice. It gives some orderly feeling. So I said, do this. Also, please provide an arcade that people can walk in. So you have a shaded space. So I've further extended my public realm into that fellow's building without really, it's his property. Now, this is exactly what Ballard Estate does, right? What else is it? It extends the public realm out. This is what it is. The street is there and it works. This is what Ballard Estate, when the re remaining places where you don't have arcades would look like this. Then to ensure future better traffic management, I might also add a few things in the plan saying along this red line, no vehicular entry into your plot. 
You see, when I'm drawing this by myself, I can check out every plot must get one vehicular entry and I'll tell him where you can take it from, from the beginning. And you can see on this main road, I've given no entries. Everybody's getting road entries from. So my main road always will, will not, you know, your sidewalks will not be cut by these driveways that get inside plots and then stop the pedestrians from moving. All of these things I can do if I draw this plan up. Now the important thing, how do I raise resources for building infrastructure? Because the resources will be needed over a period of time. So I tell them that I've given you 5.4 FSI, but out of this, you see earlier you had 1.8. That 1.8 is free. The rest of it, I'm going to charge you for. Okay, here's an important point I'd like to make. When planners say, ah, good, we'll charge them for it. Then they think, yeah, these builders make a lot of money, let's charge them a lot. Ah, 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 ah. I keep telling planners, your job is not to take away unearned increments or speculative profits. That's the taxman's job. The taxman can take away that money if it's unearned increment. But you are supposed to only take as much money as you need for creation of infrastructure. Take it liberally. But don't think of yourself as the taxman. This is a fundamental mistake a lot of planners make. They get zealous and they say, these guys are making a lot of money, let me take it away. Leave that to the finance ministry, not to the urban development ministry. Okay, so that's where you have. Then, you know, there'll be some people who will never want to redevelop. For example, the Mill Owners Association building, those people might never want to. Or in this case, what I've shown on the right-hand side is a temple. Actually, physically, there is a temple there. Those temple people will never redevelop. But as the authority, I'm interested in, in redevelopment. I want more floor space in my city. So I allow them to sell off their additional FSI, whatever they are not using, to somebody in this 1.25 square kilometers. Not outside. In this 1.25. Okay, you can do trade within that. That's your transfer of development rights, but within that limited area. So I know my the impact of this is not going to end up in some far away place. The impact of this is in this 125 and this is my this is the Lachman Rekha inside which I work. So when I add it up soon everybody will redevelop and we'll go from here to here. How long will this take? I don't know. Maybe 10 years, maybe 15, maybe 20, maybe 25. But when we redevelop we will have improved the overall situation, not just added FSI. Okay? Now, this is not how lower Parel and areas in Mumbai are redeveloping, not how Pune is redeveloping, but this is how it should be redeveloping. Now, this is just the concept. So here's detailed plan. You can see that shape, that dumbbell type shape. So we, you know, it was that area was further broken up into these smaller sheet sizes and you know it's this area I'm going to focus that's the area I'm talking about so it was first it was surveyed in detail so every building every manhole every tree was surveyed it's very easy to do that it's not very complicated then so I turn it around you know that's the same place I was talking about that mill owner association building is in the middle that same concept where I was showing. This is from the actual plan. First, you mark out center line for streets. You smoothen them out. You make Charasta meet at one point instead of meeting at two different points. You know? So this is your center line. That's where your planning starts. This work, a draftsman can do. You don't need a planner. Please, please understand. Once the rules are set, this planning can be done by relatively unsophisticated technical staff. That's another important thing in planning. If you are, if you are going to look for terrific planners everywhere, it's not going to happen, man. We don't have them. So a simple system. Then you mark out the streets and the street widening. Then you got your plots. These are the setbacks. You can see in the front along the main road, we have got no setbacks because we want a continuous arcade like Ballard Estate. Some of you who might be architects or technical people can make that out very clearly. 
दीज आर ऑल द अर्बन डिजाइन एलिमेंट बिल्ड टू लाइन आपका गाड़ी इधर से नहीं जाएगा वो नहीं जाएगा दिस ऑल पुट इन दे एंड देन दिस इज द कैलकुलेशन बिकॉज एवरीबडी कितना जमीन ले लिया कितना आपको एफ एस आई मिलना है दिस ऑल कैन बी डन इन अ वेरी सिंपल स्ट्रेट फॉरवर्ड वे दिस नथिंग कॉम्प्लिकेटेड अबाउट दिस ऑल ऑफ दिस कैन बी डन बाई रेलेटिवली अनसोफिस्टिकेटेड स्टाफ वन यू सेट ऑफ द रूल्स से बिल्डिंग के ऊपर से वाइडनिंग मत करना ये ले जाना एंड देन सम सम यू नो ट्वेंटी पीपल वर्किंग डूइंग दैट फॉर यू नो each one doing one square kilometer and then uh, one planner sitting there and checking you can imagine the planning of pura pura ka kar dena to kitna time lagega no it shouldn't take time that's another thing we must do so the business district of amdabad this was done first on the other side on the eastern side another area was also done in fact amdabad has done 43 square kilometers of this across the city i told you along all the corridors that it is And, and, and you know, so the, this is the plan, the detailed plan as proposed. This is the street network. This is what it looks like today. This is this is what the plan looks like. It's very simple. The plan is only one plan, Kagaj, and there's nothing, no money involved except what you have to pay the planners for the survey for this and that. It's not an expensive exercise. You don't need a fancy consultant to do this. I mean, you need a good consultant, but you don't need you don't need foreign expert. Okay, you don't need Singapore wala ye wo. देसी एकदम सो देन वी ऑल्सो एट दैट टाइम टू शो वॉट वुड हैपन वी डिड दिस विजुअलाइजिंग ऑफ द प्रोसेस ऑफ रीडेवलपमेंट वी सेड के दिस एरिया टूडे लुक्स लाइक दिस दिस आशम रोड यू नो वी सेड कि सम डे इन द फ्यूचर द मेट्रो विल कम या नाउ द मेट्रो हेज शिफ्टेड टू एडजेसेंट अलॉन्ग द रेलवे लाइन राइट नेक्स्ट टाइम इधर नहीं आने वाली है बट एट दैट टाइम वी थॉट इट्स गोइंग टू कम यर सो वी शोड इट यर एंड वी सेड कि एक बिल्डिंग बनेगा पीछे वो देखा आपने messy uncoordinated incremental process that's what you are seeing here then somebody else will build something some people say i'll build some streets and put some trees there and then some more trees grow and some more buildings come up and slowly that area turned from what it was originally into this or you take here this is what another part of this place maybe one building will come up and another metro will come and then a third building and this and this and this what you're trying to do is trying to set up a process that in 20 years will add up or 20 or 25 years will add up not today today you don't even have the money to build all of this okay and 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 you and nobody has the money to build these buildings either okay so you can't suddenly modernize a city so here's another visualization this was the river front as we used to see it in the 70s uh, 80s it is the late 70s early 80s uh, this is after the riverfront project then we said this is what you might see and then this and then this because center of town will grow one way or the other it will grow lower patel is growing pune is growing every it will grow then we had to explain this plan to people have we talked about something very important trust you must build trust with people uh, you will always find some some people who are mindless opposers of things but you vast majority of the people will understand if you explain so what we did was we built a model and we put up visualizations and we took it to a real estate fair in a real estate fair the plan was presented to people so here are people standing there looking at it imagining what this is going to be they ask questions to the planner is standing there this is a mela you can you know you put a model there people come look at it it becomes part of the system of the city you make brochures like this and say this is what you are going to get etc now the proof of any plan proof of any concept is whether it is implemented or not and i think you said that 100% right you might make a great plan but if its implementation is 7% 10% 20% 30% 40% 50% 60% 70% fail i put the bar very high if you if your plan cannot be implemented 85 90% in the period that you are imagining it will be forget about it you're not doing anything you're just you're just fooling people and that's what indian planners have done for years for seven decades all that we have done is made fantastic plans and then blame everybody else for them not being we blame the context we blame indians we blame lack of resources blame this and that and the other i could do you another talk about how to make planning work but that's not the day today this plan 
only thing to check whether it's good or bad is whether it's getting implemented. Okay, so here you have at present this is what it is and I said it's going to be incremental and someday it will be like this but these four, five, six buildings have come up according to this plan. This was some time ago, it's not dated. So here's the brochure. You can see that uh, shape on the top uh, left hand corner is that area. You can see that red spot, the plot. You can see this is the brochure of the builder that had proposed this. You can see he's showing the riverfront at the back and he's showing, you can see the building footprint is quite large. You can see he has left a lot of land outside for city to take over. And that's the building built today according to this plan. Okay, and That's built. You can see earlier satellite image, second satellite image. Small building giving way to large building. You have another building, another brochure. Okay, And this is, this is built. Now, they, they purchased the FSI, they gave up the land and they built the building. This is another building that's coming up. It's dug into the ground just now. Now, let me show you some images I showed you. You know, at that time we visualized, but I just got this done last week. We went, I just found some more purana visualization job. Okay, so here you have something like this. We found an image like this from the riverfront. You used to see that area. Today, this is where that building has come up. The riverfront is also built, the building has also come up. This, I showed you this image earlier. This today looks like this. You see that building at the back, it's come up. It's like the visualization we had earlier. Here's the area, other area. You can see here the tall buildings have started coming up. But they have started coming up with the street network improving simultaneously. Here's another view. And this has become like this. You can see these buildings have come up according to this plan. So these projects are benefiting from this the local area plan. The city is also benefiting through the charges it levies on these. Right? So the FSI is sold. And here's a simple, these four, peop four people have contributed. Uh, uh, the total uh, revenue from this is 91 crores from four buildings. There are 500 buildings in this one square kilometer. Oh, sorry, 200 buildings in this one square kilometer. You can imagine the amount of money that municipal corporation is going to keep getting and it can use this money to build the infrastructure there. One square kilometer doesn't need that much amount of money. Okay, So that's and then this plan is this methodology has been accepted by the MOHUA and it's being touted everywhere. Not many cities have picked it up. So as I said, peripheral expansion and in-city redevelopment both need to be well managed. I hope I've explained why and how this may perhaps be done. Thank you very much. <coughs> Apologies if I took longer than you had planned. Yeah. Professor Pete, may I please request you to initiate the Q&A and just before that I would like to mention to you sir um, that almost three and a half decades ago uh, the mayor of Bogota, Enrique Penelosa was in Pune, he was invited by NGO Parisar and he gave a presentation on BRT and Pune was the first city in the country to launch the BRT but as we know uh, year after year, it was the Ahmedabad BRT which uh, would get the top prize for excellent implementation. So, is it really? Uh, 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 and and the delegation from Pune went to see the Ahmedabad BRT. So, uh, does it continue to be as good as it was uh, then? And uh, with this first question, I would uh, hand over to Professor Pete, and uh, he could then initiate the Q and A.
Okay, um, it's it's a very pertinent question regarding the BRT of Ahmedabad. I was involved at that time in the initial decision to try and push, uh, promote the idea of a BRT. Uh, and you told me that we should perhaps even talk of some of our mistakes and failures. Okay. And so here I'd like to say something. Over time, over the last 20 years since Ahmedabad and did the BRT and we were pushing the BRT. I have somewhat changed, now it's a little bit complicated, I've somewhat changed my idea of how we should look at these sort of transportation issues. Whenever we, we try to solve a problem by identifying some people as the good guys and some people as the bad guys and we say we won't help the bad guys and we'll help the good guys. Those type of solutions are a little problematic always. You're a mature audience and I don't mind talking about this com complicated issue here. I think as planners we have to be a little more agnostic about what method people use to solve their problems. For example, uh, let me take another. Earlier planners would say, I want residential here, industrial here, office here, this here, that here. They would try and design the final outcome in a very detailed way. You realize that this is a very poor way to do planning. Actually, it's not for the planner to decide, it's for the market to decide. It's not the same in transportation. But in transportation, if the planner plays a similar thing saying, I have so much road space available and I'm going to take so much guarded against. I'm not saying BRTS is entirely bad in some. It, sh it should be somehow more of a natural outcome than in many places. What we must measure, how must we should say, say, do planning? We must measure the, what are we trying to improve? We are trying to improve transportation, mobility for people. And keep our mind clearly focused on that. What does that mean? At the least cost and these terms, this means both. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. What we must focus on is this number. What is it that people are, 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 are spending in terms of time and cost for mobility? And we must keep our mind focused on that and try to reduce that. If this means that it's best done by a lot of private taxis, that's quite okay. If this is, this means that a BRTS is the best solution, that's quite okay too. We shouldn't go about this business saying BRTS is the good thing because it is collective transport, because it is public transport. We take that value and apply it, we might well get a suboptimal solution. And I must say, and I say this in humbly and I say it without trying to point fingers at anybody because I was myself involved in promoting the BRTS at that time. When I see today in Ahmedabad also traffic jam packed on two sides and the BRTS in the middle empty road space not being used it appears to me like that land around buildings that have forced people to suboptimally use. I have bylaws. In the bylaws, ke hisab se, this fellow is not able to, sp to use anything. Is that the right way of doing things? Perhaps not. To have an answer for how to do transportation, I am really not a transportation planning person. But to others who are involved in transportation, I see, are 
आपके स्ट्रैटेजी में कुछ गलत लगता है ट्राई एंड फाइंड अ स्ट्रैटेजी दैट इज दैट डजेंट दैट नॉट बेस्ड ऑन ऑन प्रमोटिंग सर्टन वैल्यूज एंड 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 सर बिकॉज दोज आर मॉरल वैल्यूज दैट वी गेट देट गेट इन समटाइम्स इन टू द वे ऑफ वॉट इज वॉट मेक्स सेंसिबल स्ट्रैटेजी आई डोंट नो इट दिस आंसर योर क्वेश्चन सो अहमदाबाद बी आर टी एस येस इट इज डूइंग वेल फर्स्ट थिंग दे डिड वॉज ए बी आर टी एस में नॉर्मल बस इसको चलने का राइट दे दिया बट इवन देन प्लेस इज एंटी एंड वी आर नॉट यूटिलाइजिंग इट सो दे समथिंग स्टिल समथिंग मोर दैट नीड्स टू बी डन ट्रांसपोर्टेशन प्लानर्स नीड टू टेक रियल लुक एट वॉट वी हैव अचीव एंड हाउ वी नीड टू इम्प्रूव नॉट जस्ट स्टिक विद Yeah, right at the back. I yeah, but use use the mic. Sir, I I agree with you that a uh, significant portion of urban land is locked up uh, with uh, private and underutilized or suboptimal utilized. But in order to uh, solve that problem, uh, how prudent is it that we are imposing a early twentieth century idea? of uh, modernist urban planning uh, and proponents such as Lee Corbusier and that those uh i can can i be heard yeah okay uh i don't know in what sense you mean early 20th century corbusian planning because early 20th century corbusian planning is what has led to our kind of city structure if you look at the land use in chandigarh is perhaps even worse than in the older towns you see our, our indian planning seems to have emerged out of two practices the the kind that led to this land distribution seems to have come out of two practices one practice it came out of was uh, uh the building of new towns in india kobuzia was just the last one but jamshedpur uh uh um, bhuneshwar lakhans delhi these were new towns being built at that time they proposed that you should build buildings amidst gardens and you should be low density they were all actually learning from the garden city movement of england kobuzia might not say he learned from that but he was also he made a different shape of a garden city nothing more than that otherwise it's essentially that same idea you know he 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 made it look like his paintings rather than looking like some uh, british uh, suburb picturesque suburb he wanted it to look like that so kobuzia garden cities new towns and indeed we have a long history of having the native town and the cantonment town the cantonment town is little buildings with compounds all around land all around this fed the imagination of indian planners at that time i don't know what you mean by early modernist uh early modernist kobuzia was that waste of land what instead i'm i'm proposing is an earlier model of 19th century ballard estate actually take a walk around ballard estate it's perhaps the best model you can have or you look at other such 19th century developments in the country done by british planners at that time which were in tight conditions marine drive for example much better land use along marine drive. Uh, not as good as it can be in ballard estate but even better so that whole tradition of planning got set aside by this garden city type of planning we applied it to all our cities we have ended up with the cities we have now we have to go from there so i am not following any model i'm saying people need floor space banana hai. we need compact cities banana hai. right we need more space in the public domain i have to get that so i'm not following a model and doing it i'm saying i'm solving problems i don't have a given solution the solution emerges from trying to solve problem i'm trying to increase land in the public domain i'm trying to increase land uh, in building cover and both of them are you know and to minimize the amount that is that 
is held in private domain, but that fellow can't use it. I'm trying to minimize that. These are the three objectives. Aisa karoge, result hi aega. It's not... Now, I'm not saying you build tall buildings. That's okay, tall buildings in some parts. Some place you could have valid estate type of low buildings. That's not problem. My development envelope, if I had made it lower, then also considerable amount of FSI orders stuck in here. Maybe not 5.4, but 3 tak toh Aram say in that development envelope, you'll give enough flexibility to people. So I, I believe that we must approach, we must invent the method. I am not an uh, ism and ideology driven planner. We must look the problem straight in the eye and try to solve it. And I think that's, that's related also to the earlier question. Uh, good afternoon. Hello, hello. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, my name is Shruti Vaisham and I have briefly worked at HCP in 2010. Uh, so I have followed your work since then. Um, really appreciate uh, this session today. Uh, I have a few uh, questions regarding the case study of the Ashram Road area that we presented. First being, is there a LAP provision in the GPPUDA uh, Act? Second, uh, what kind of social safeguards uh, should the planner keep in mind when we are, uh, you know, doing this kind of a, uh, maybe, you know, like form based uh, kind of planning for an area? If you are looking at smaller neighborhoods, right now in Pune, if you see the redevelopment, smaller buildings are getting redevelopment to slightly bigger buildings, as you rightly put it. Uh, but what is happening is the uh, the new buyers are from a slightly upper, uh, you know, social class, uh, economic class. And uh, thus what is happening is these redevelopment projects are very exclusive. Although the original owners are retained in place. So if this kind of redevelopment happens in various neighborhoods, one after the other, are we heading uh, towards a slightly upscale, uh, you know, type of, and is there a fear of um, gentrification, if I may use the word? Uh, the third question, is there is there a recipe? Sorry? Okay. Uh, the first one was, is there a LAP provision in your hat? No, in fact, there was no provision to, to, to make a plan like this. We first made the plan, then the provision was created. Remember, uh, uh, when you want to make statutory plans, you have to have something, some act that allows you to make that sort of a statutory plan. And the act had no provision to make a plan like this. So first we made the plan and we said provision nahi hai, so now we make the provision. So planning has to be looked at as this dynamic thing where you even create the tools through which you are able to do your thing. So answer to your question is no, it wasn't there, now it is there. It is... Uh, it, it was put in, it's being amended just now. There is some controversy about how to amend it, but otherwise we are in the process. As soon as I see some improvement being tried, I think we are at least on the track. So that's the first question. The second question was related to uh, uh, social, safe. social uh, safeguards. There are things that planners have the mandate to do and statutory mandate to do and things they don't have a statute. Uh, I think quite rightly we don't have the mandate to try and man try and engineer the kind of population we get in any way. This is not something that anybody ought to be doing also. And we as planners have this well-minded attitude of trying to solve all the problems. Uh, we want to take on everything. In the process, we solve nothing. So, what I am trying to do is trying to increase the public domain in the long run. The increase of public domain is actually a socially very progressive thing to do. We are taking things away from private hands and putting them in the public domain, improving the amount of assets that everybody can use. 
there can be you know it's a progressive direction in which we are moving uh if an area is going to get gentrified i have i haven't seen anywhere in the world that a planner has been able to do anything about it no way because if it fits an area that is that that wealthier people find attractive and want to live there they will pay off these people and move now who am i as a planner to get in a bit get in between both of these and say no the poor must live here I, i don't think that that either we have the mandate i actually believe we shouldn't even have the mandate uh, to to do this work. so i i'm a great advocate for focus uh, there is a there is a common friend and colleague of ours patak sahab in bombay he and i when we if we we say we often you know shaking our heads saying planners want to solve every problem in the world and they don't manage to solve the basic thing that they are doing land use planning or some orderly growth building of infrastructure it's quite a task then uh, sorry just Uh, okay, this gentleman here. Uh, hello, sir. Sir, how do you see this whole uh, electric vehicle transition from petrol-based or diesel-based vehicles uh, in the process of urban planning? I think I already answered that. I don't see it. It's not my area. Sir, very good afternoon. Sir, uh, my question is that, sir, basically, I am uh, my hometown is Varanasi, so it's uh, important question from you that, sir, what motivates and thrives uh, for the new uh, Baba Vishwanath Kasi Dam project? Because, sir, uh, this city is having its historical importance and various uh, incidents which has been cited at the earliest from various magnanimous people like Mr. Gandhi in 1916. Uh, like hence some in historical ins, uh, historical ins, inscriptions he said yahan ki galiyan bahut choti hain gandhi hain fir bhi uh, it's a historical so I, i just want to know ki jo baba vishwanath ka uh, parishar jo hai 700 se 1200 square feet mein tha aaj wo lagbhag 1 lakh 25 uh, square feet ke aas paas phail chuka hai aur is kinare se us kinare uh, ganga nadi mein स्नान करना हो वहां से जल लेके आके बाबा विश्वनाथ को अर्पित करने के बीच में सर व्हाट मोटिवेट्स एंड इंस्पायर्ड यू टू ड्रॉ दिस मैग्नेटिमस प्रोजेक्ट फॉर दिस कंट्री इट वाज इट वाज दैट प्रोजेक्ट इज नॉट अ प्लानिंग प्रोजेक्ट टुडे इज अ प्लानिंग टॉक बट सिंस आई वेयर दैट अदर हैट दैट प्रोजेक्ट इज नोन सो इट्स द आर्किटेक्चर प्रोजेक्ट आई वाज एंगेज्ड एज एन आर्किटेक्ट and as you are aware it's not the architect who decides ki kya karna you are called in to help with solving some problem and that was already decided i believe there has been a plan for very long time that there was a desire to create facilities for the pilgrims who are coming to create a a, a, a nice approach to the temple from the river because from the city the approaches are not that uh easy uh and so that's the the motivation was all that if you see if you want to see in detail there must be a presentation i have done that presentation on youtube you will find it and you will find the whole project described and what the project what problems the project was trying to solve so mera motivation nahi tha uh it was not uh, it was i was uh, as an architect working on some project and for architects often the projects are defined well before they get to the stage all right uh, <clears throat> i don't know if dr bimal jan which bimal will have time to discuss but maybe a couple of you just as we are walking and uh we will have 
I'm not going to take again a lot of time. Uh, just two or three major takeaways and one is of course the underlying modesty and focus and patience. These are the three things that shine across and this without being having an iota of diffidence, being very confident about what you're doing, but saying that, listen, we're not going to be all comprehensive, we're not here to solve everything, this is what we want to do, and these are the kind of guardrails we are setting out to do. This will take time, which will require patience, because that requires a level of maturity, which is a takeaway in planning. Uh, at least as far as I am concerned, I still have a worry about the capacity to do this kind of a thing, the messiness that is involved, which is bound to be there. It is part of, a, I'm an economist really, so I work with trade-offs, so it's natural that uh, if there is going to be a lot of time and patience required, uh, there is going to be messiness along the way. There are no clear solutions, although some of the things that will be seen on the paper might be neat. That's not the way things are going to happen. The confidence we get is from what he prefaced by talking about, that this is the way it has happened all over the world. And we don't need to be disheartened by what, where we are. We don't need to be hopelessly optimistic, although Abhay uh, Vaidya said that in PIC we are. We don't need to be that. We need to be realistic and we need to have patience. We will find solutions. That is the main takeaway through all the turning because we have opted for a value of participatory democracy. The polity is not mature. We are a young nation. We will get there some point, at some point of time. And we will develop the capacity to do that. So thank you very much for a very hopeful picture, a very focused uh, kind of a picture. Thank you. I just make two quick points. Uh, one is uh, we want to thank uh, Professor Ajay Shah for facilitating this lecture and for connecting us with uh, Dr. Bimal Patel. And that's how this event has happened. The second thing is, uh, we are going to invite Dr. Bimal Patel again to come and speak to us on the Pune Riverfront Development Project. So he is involved in it, he is engaged in it and uh, that was actually going to be the original talk but at some point in the future we are going to plan it. And uh, before uh, I hand over the floor to my colleague Dr. Vishal uh, Gaikwad for the vote of thanks, we would like to present uh, Dr. Patel with a publication from PIC. Uh, this is India's Pathways to Success 2030. Professor Pate, may I please request you to present it to Dr. Patel. And the other book is the previous uh, book from PIC, Rising to the China Challenge. Thank you very much. Yeah, please. Uh, thank you, sir. One quick thing. Yes, I forgot to thank Ajay Shah. And, uh, Dr. Vijay Kelkar, both of whom who actually brought originally uh, asked me to come here. Incidentally, their book, so Dr. Kelkar's book, uh, 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 which is uh, uh, in service of the Republic, I came across it a, a, a year ago. I was thrilled by it and have made it compulsory textbook for all the planners who are at SEP. So I, I think that is a, a tremendous contribution that uh, both of them have made to, to uh, public understanding of public policy issues. And indeed, uh, uh, it, it's the only way in which planners who actually make public policy can be educated. So, uh, so thanks to both of them for inviting me. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Professor Apte, for chairing the session. Now we are all just witness a tremendous, engaging morning and af afternoon learning and takeaways on this uh, managing urban development 
stop. Unfortunately, the event must end, but not before the round of applauses and thank you. At the outset of uh, and on behalf of the Pune International Center and Gokul Institute of Politics and Economics, I would like to extend our heartfelt gratitude to our speaker, uh, Dr. Bimal Patel. Uh, we look forward to many more engagements with you, sir. Uh, then uh, a round of applause to for our uh, PIC staff and Gokul Institute staff for their untiring efforts for the planning that uh, you put behind every event. My sincere thanks to all PIC trustees uh, and members for attending this session. Students, no event is ever complete without your interest and enthusiastic participation. To continue, uh, uh, do continue to support PIC events in the future as well. I also thanks uh, uh, members of the media for your continuing and positive coverage of PIC events and the last but certainly not least, the Punekas and others in the audience, we greatly appreciate your uh, presence. Uh, we have now come to the end of today's program. Thank you and uh, wish you a great day ahead. Thank you.